In Good Shape, your health magazine on DW, featuring an interview with a different expert every week. With me in the green studio today is Professor Christian Werner. He is Director of the Anesthesiology Department at Mainz University Hospital and Vice President of the German Anesthesiology and Intensive Medicine Society. Hello and welcome to In Good Shape. Thank you very much. How often do patients wake up during surgery? Well, the numbers vary, but we believe it's about one to two patients out of thousand that uh, receive general anesthesia. It's quite a lot, isn't it? It is very concerning and it depends a little bit on the sensitivity of patients um, uh, to anesthetic agents. It depends uh, on the surgical intervention. For example, if you have a patient in shock or for cesarean section, we tend to go low on the anesthesia because of the cardiovascular depression. But it is also a function of uh, structural mistakes, mislabeling of, of syringes, etc. Right. So it's a, a whole array of reasons why this unfortunate high number occurs. So waking up during the procedure is one risk and one fear patients have. The other fear is that they don't wake up at all after the, the surgery. Is this a common problem? Well, of course, not a common yeah. problem, but a, a real problem as well. The numbers that are available are from the Netherlands from the end of the 90s. Good numbers, large collective, and it seems that about eight to nine patients in 10,000 patients really remain comatose are dead or are dead after 24 hours from surgery and, and, and anesthesia. And those eight to nine deaths or comatose survivors are related, correlated with dysfunction of anesthetic management. So the, the numbers are 20 years old. So do you think something changed in anesthesiology since that day? We don't have new numbers, but I bet the numbers are better today. We have surgical safety checklists, we have structured algorithms, we have, have much better training, we have better technology, better medication. So I don't know where it is now, but it must be better. Good. And I always uh, allow uh, in this country, anybody to uh, provide anesthesia to myself. Okay, so, so, so you wouldn't be too scared. You would, no, you would not just at go all. for it. And, and can patients do something to, um, to um, yeah, say, say, not to die? So, so, how can they assist the anesthesiologist? Well, they can certainly assist the anesthesiologist in being open, in providing him with all the relevant information of their medical history. Uh, the anesthesiologist needs to t tell them, to teach them on their preoperative behavioral patterns such as uh, no smoking, no food, no, no drinking. We are uh, very focused to, a, to an empty stomach because we fear bronchopneumonia aspiration. Uh, so that is something that because can be stuff done. of the stomach. Correct, correct. Stuff. If you have regurgitation of uh, content from the stomach into the pulmonary uh, system, that is something we're really concerned about. And then um, reducing fear, I think, is a very important uh, endpoint of that pre-anesthetic conversation between the physicians and the patient. And, and could regional anesthesia be the solution? Is it more safe? than um, the, the, the full getting to sleep? Well, it's not safer in terms of the incidence of, of, of complication, complicative courses. But it is, there is a, there is a, a revival of uh, regional anesthesia most currently because it is believed that it at least reduces cardiovascular risk right. and improves um, intestinal function. And, and certainly is, uh, is advantageous in the post-operative period to treat pain. Is it true that 99% anesthesia is boring to the doctor and 1% is terror? Well, I know that joke he's saying, but I think that notion really tells me uh, that there is misconception and misperception of the anesthesia profession. No, I would fundamentally disagree with that. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't fly with a pilot who says that 99% of flying is, is fun and 1% is fear. I like that analogy. Yeah, right. And um, why do children and older people have higher risks in um, anesthesia? Well, certainly for the older people, there is comorbidity, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, there is metabolic disease, and those patients are prone to uh, under, undergo complications. For the kids, I think it's a matter of training, of lack of opportunity. That's why we believe that centers should, should focus their attention to pediatric populations uh, in order to have this 
training effect, uh, the, the rehearsal effect, and, and, and the routine effect that is always good for, for, for anybody, certainly. But, but even if the operation goes fine and the anesthesia goes fine, uh, people still have the fear that um, if they are anesthetized, that they get stupid from it, that they get dementia. Is there any truth to that? Well, let's talk about the, the kids first. Um, there was, uh, there was a, some a basic science evidence that anesthetics pr are neurotoxic in a, in a very early phase of, of, of human uh, growth. Uh, we now learned from a most recent publication in a large international trial that if you have anesthesia within the first 60 weeks of age and then get tested at the sec end of the second year of age, there was no difference between regional anesthesia and general anesthesia in terms of cognitive function. So that makes us optimistic that the yeah. basic science results cannot be translated. That it's a safe procedure. But, but uh, what if you get to uh, through frequent anesthesia, say you had not operated once, but twice, five times, ten times? Always mind that damage, uh, as you say, is a composite damage, which is probably related to anesthesia, but certainly also to the surgical trauma, the inflammatory response, the hospitalization, the social deprivation. And yes, though we have no hard evidence-based data, it is likely that uh, there is a cumulative effect in, in that if you have a lot of those episodes of hospitalization, surgery, anesthesia, that this might be more harmful than a single episode. So, so one solution could be to go for regional anesthesia. And, uh, but, but is this a safe procedure, say nerve damages? Well, nerve, nerve damages occur, that is a typical risk, but as I said before, uh, regional anesthesia ha undergoes a very interesting renaissance because of the reduction of uh, cardiovascular morbidity and, and, and of course, the, the, the asset, the talent of regional anesthesia to control for pain postoperatively. And, and what about those short kinds of anesthesia when you go for, say, a colonoscopy and you get in the office setting some propofol just for getting to sleep? Is this dangerous? It was probably a little bit more risky in the past, but with current standards, with current algorithms, with current guidelines on office-based anesthesia, particularly in the context that you were discussing, I don't think that this is a harmful procedure at all anymore. Right. Professor Werner, thanks so much for being with us in the studio today. Thank you. Thank you.